Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've been in meetings before where there weren't many people and it's not much fun. <laughs> you know, you grow little by little and I started out in the basement of my home. That's where my ministry started, in the basement of my home. And uh, I did little tiny Bible studies for five years and then I worked at a church for five years and then God told me to take the ministry and go north, south, east, and west. And I did so many meetings of 25 people and 50 people and 70 people. I, if I got a crowd of 100, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And uh, I'm grateful that I never gave up and made it to where I am now. And I'm anxious to see what else God does with me before he takes me home. Amen. Amen. I just had my 80th birthday this year, so... It's kind of interesting how you feel when you know that you've lived most of your life. And I think, well, even if I live to be 100, which I'm not sure I want to, but you know, <laughs> even if I did, I would only have 20 years left. And so I've decided to make the most out of the ones that I got left. And so I pretty much just say whatever I want to now when I'm in the pulpit. <laughs> and do what I please. Give a shout out to Dave over there. <clears throat> You're supposed to let them see you. They have to see you. I'll tell you, Dave's a good looking guy. He takes care of himself. He still wears the same size clothes he did when we got married. And uh, he, he's a good guy. We, uh, we've been married in a few weeks, 57 years. We have four kids, 12 grandkids, and six great-grandkids, so I said, all I do is write checks. I just stay busy. <laughs> right. I don't even bother with the gift bag and the tissue paper. I, whoever knows that, I just write checks. That's easier, checks and envelopes. So let me ask you a question. If I said to you, while you're here at church today, somebody has come in and cleaned your house and it's gonna stay clean forever. You'll never have to do it. It's been done once and for all. How would you like that? Wouldn't that be awesome? Or if I said, while you've been here today, somebody went to your house and they gathered up all your bills and they paid all your bills. And not only did they pay all your bills that you had, they're taking care of all your bills that you ever will have. How many of you would think that would be good? Well, there's somebody that's done something for you that you'll never have to do again for yourself. Amen. And that's paid for your sins. Right. Once and for all. I, got, I, was, I was reading Hebrews and I kept coming across that statement in the Amplified Bible, once and for all, once and for all, once and for all. And I thought, man, we don't get it. You know, he didn't just do it once. He did, the one time he did it, I mean, he did just do it once, but the one time he did it, it shall avail for all time. You never have to beg God to forgive your sins. They're already forgiven. All you have to do is admit you've sinned, confess your sins and say, I receive, I receive the forgiveness that you provided for me in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know, I'm not gonna tell you that there's never consequences for sin because there is. Let's just say that somebody murders somebody. Well, they're gonna go to prison. Now, they can be forgiven by God and they can still have a good life even inside those prison walls because it's not, it's not outer freedom that gives us a good life, it's inner freedom. It's knowing who you are in Christ and being free and not having to live under the weight of sin and guilt and not having to be mad at everybody and being able to forgive people. Those are the things that really make you free. And so even a person in prison, and I've preached in many prisons and I tell them this, you can be freer in here than some people are out there. Because your real freedom comes from within you. And so I wanna to talk to you today about some of these scriptures that say that Jesus has done this for us once and for all. And I wanna to talk to you about how we continue to try to do something that Jesus has already done 
and how it steals our joy and steals our peace. Once and for all means now and for the last time, finally, positively, and absolutely never needs to be done again. Earlier this year, I had a, a boo-boo. I had a minor back surgery and ended up getting a blood clot at the surgery site and had to have a second surgery. I never had any kind of pain like you have from a blood clot. I would have rather had three babies. I mean, it was... <laughs> It was so bad, I don't even remember it. My kids said I was on my hands and knees screaming, get me to the hospital. Because it, was, it affected all the nerves in my, down my back and down my leg. And so this leg was traumatized or damaged to a certain degree, the nerves in it from the blood clot. And so I couldn't move it after the surgery at all. I mean, I could barely just pick it up off the bed. So I had to spend two weeks in a rehab hospital and they got me to the point where I could walk on a walker, barely. And I got home and my own fault, thinking I could do things I couldn't do. I fell and broke this leg. And now you gotta be talented to tear up both legs <laughs> at once. And uh, so long story short, two and a half months in a wheelchair, that was a lot of fun. To go To go to the bathroom, you have to they have to put a board under your bottom and you slide across that board onto the wheelchair <laughs> and you go to the bathroom and you let down the side of the wheelchair, you slide onto the toilet, and then you gotta slide back and you go slide back in your chair. I tell you, I got so good at sliding, it was absolutely amazing. <laughs> and it was pretty hard on my family too. Somebody had to stay with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week and so my my family really stepped up and my kids all took turns staying on four hour shifts and Dave did everything he could do to help me. But it was, it was quite an ordeal. And let me tell you, when I went to the doctor for the last time and he said, okay, it's over. You never have to come back again. Woo! I was so glad to hear that I never had to do it again. Amen? Amen. Same way when I had cancer 32 years ago, I had breast cancer and I had to have a surgery and but I was very blessed. None of the cancer had gotten to my lymph nodes. And so when I went to the oncologist to find out what was next, she said, I've got good news for you. You don't have to have any treatment, no chemo, no radiation. You never have to come back again. Woo, I was so glad to know that I never had to do it again. And I hope you can get that excited when I tell you that Jesus has paid for your sins and you never have to try to pay again. You know what that means? When you, yeah, come on. Woo. Ooh, this is gonna be a happy message today. Wow. Let me tell you something else that you never have to do again. After you sin, you never have to feel guilty. Yeah. Yep, you reacted about like the second service did. <laughs> huh? Can you find one place in the Bible where it tells you to feel guilty? Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And even after you sin and you've repented and you've been forgiven, he'll come back around and try to accuse you. Have you ever woken up one morning and had the devil tell you what you did right yesterday? <laughs> but I bet you there's plenty of mornings you wake up and the first thing you think about is what you did wrong yesterday. He wants you to not only have a miserable day yesterday, he wants to assure you that you have a miserable day today by thinking about the miserable thing you did yesterday. Amen? <laughs> now, I don't live like that anymore. I used to. For years, I lived like that. Guilt was my best buddy. I just took it with me everywhere that I went. From being abused as a child sexually, I guess somewhere along the line, I got the idea it was my fault. And so I always felt 
guilty. It didn't even, you know, I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. I always felt like something was wrong with me. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And it took me a long time, a long time to get over guilt. It was like this vague presence that was with me all the time. Not like right in my face, but this vague feeling something's wrong with me. Does anybody in here have any idea what I'm feeling, what I'm talking about? And well, I pray right now in Jesus' name you get this today because if you do, it'll change your life forever. And I finally learned that I'm not supposed to live by how I feel, but by what the word says. <laughs> and I started applying that to this thing about guilt. And when I would feel guilty, I would say out loud, I feel guilty, but I'm not guilty because the word of God says I'm forgiven and the sin and the guilt are removed. And then I'd still feel guilty and I'd say, I feel guilty, but I'm not guilty because the word of God says that my sins have been forgiven and all the guilt has been removed. I'm not guilty. I don't care how you make me feel, devil. I am not guilty. I am forgiven. And you know what? When I did it enough times, I started to believe it. And see, when you believe it, we have a lot of information, but what we need is revelation. And I want what's in your head today to fall down in your spirit. I want you to get it. If you've asked God to forgive your sins and you meant it, you are not guilty. I pronounce you not guilty. I don't know if you have any idea how wonderful it is for me to live like this after all the years that I suffered with always feeling like there was something wrong with me and always feeling that I kept trying to do something to make up for it or do something to make sure God was pleased with me. We did a survey at our office, which I thought, thought these answers were so amazing. We asked, when you get to heaven, or if you could ask Jesus three questions right now, what would they be? And you know what the number one thing was that came in? How can I know when I've done enough? These are all Christians that work for me. How can I know when I've done enough? And see, that's totally the wrong question for anybody who really understands the word because we can never do enough. That's why he did it for us. Amen. (laughs) It depends on whether you want to live in Christ or in yourself. See, he that knew no sin became sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. If you just go through the Bible and you really pick out all the scriptures that say in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, I've got something online you can look it up. It's like you just put in knowing who you are in Christ by Joyce Meyer and you'll get this big long list of scriptures that tell you who you are in Christ. The Bible says, I am complete in Christ. I'm holy in Christ, sanctified in Christ, justified in Christ. (laughs) You know what it means to be justified? Made just as if you never sinned, just as innocent as a newborn baby. I'll tell you really the truth, in Christ, I am something else. (laughs) I even had Santa Claus ask to take his picture with me the other day in the mall. (laughs) That was funny. Santa Claus is like, can I have my picture with you? Yeah, sure. (laughs) 
Uh, I don't know. I got something stirring in me. I hope y'all get this today. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. (laughs) He was talking about the law. He fulfilled the law. And guess what? We are no longer under the rules and regulations of the Old Testament law. So stop trying to drag them into your New Testament life. You make rules and regulations for yourself. I have to pray, I have to do this, I have to read the Bible, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. Well, you don't have to do any of that. You get to, and the truth is, you want to. In Ezekiel 36, it says, I will give you A new heart, I will take the stony, hardened heart out of you and give you a heart of flesh. The Amplified says, sensitive to the touch of our God. And I will put my spirit within you. So two things happen at the new birth. You get a new heart, all things pass away and all things are made new and God gives us his Holy Spirit. I love the fact that he says, I'll take the hardened stony heart out of you. The law, the, ten, the Old Testament law came on stone tablets. But now we don't need those stone tablets anymore. You know why? Because the law is written in our hearts. And we know right from wrong. We know now we need the teaching of the word of God, but you know, even, even without that, we, we've got a sensing of what's right and what's wrong because God has written the law in our hearts. Then he's given us his spirit, his Holy Spirit to teach us how to let him work with us to get what's in us out of us so people can see it. That's all right, hold on. I learned, in the sec- I learned in the second service, everybody was so quiet. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you guys just be as quiet as you want to, I don't care. <laughs> There's no more additions that we can make to what Jesus has done for us. He's done everything that ever needed to be done. And <laughs> the Bible says, that when he ascended on high, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. (laughs) There to wait for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet. Wow. And then, wait, you know what else it says in Ephesians 2, 6? And we are seated in him. Somebody got it. So you know what that means? I can run this ministry while I'm on vacation. I don't have to worry about the bills. I don't have to worry about what people think of me. I don't have to worry about whether they like me or they don't. You know, all I care about is I'm in Christ. And if you don't like me, take it up with him. See, we get to enter his rest. I get up every day and I do the best I can, not because I think I have to, but because I love the Lord so much, I can hardly stand it. I don't, I don't try to do right to get him to love me. He loved me before the foundation of the earth. <laughs> he loved you before he ever even created the earth. You can never get God to love you any more than he does right now. No matter how much, many more things you do right, he'll never love you anymore because his love is perfect. He loves you, period, end of the conversation. You might as well just accept it. God is not for sale. You can't buy him with good works. I try to be good every day because I love God not to get him to love me. I want you to try to be good, but not to earn something from God. You can't earn your salvation. 
It was given to you as a free gift by the grace of God. Mm. So you don't have to pay for it either. It's a free gift. You don't have to pay for it by feeling bad about yourself. You don't have to pay for it by guilt. You don't have to pay for it by not enjoying your life. That was another way that I tried to pay for my sins. I would not let myself enjoy my life. I didn't think I deserved to, because after all, I wasn't, I wasn't good. I hadn't been good that day. I remember one night I was laying on the couch watching a movie and I could feel that vague sense of guilt that I was talking to you about earlier. And I finally just, I thought, God, what is wrong with me? Why do I, why do I lay here? Why do I feel guilty? Movies clean. The popcorn's low fat. <laughs> the ice cream's no sugar added. What? I'm not, what am I doing wrong? He just said, you feel guilty because you feel like you don't deserve to enjoy yourself. See, <laughs> Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. I wonder how many people here are not enjoying their life. And I'm not talking about enjoying a vacation. I'm not talking about enjoying a, a shopping trip. I'm talking about enjoying plain old ordinary Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and back to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and do it again and again and again and again and again and go to work and go to work and clean the house and go to work and drive the car and get gas and get you know how you do that? You get in Christ and you stay there. And you just keep the one commandment he gave you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. And in doing that, loving yourself and others, you'll keep all of the commandments that God ever gave. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. You haven't had any fun until you start focusing on just loving other people. What our brother said about Acts 20, 35 is more blessed to give than to receive is 100% true. It is amazing how happy you get when you actually focus on what you can do for other people. I'm so proud of this congregation that 27, did they say families stepped up to foster children. This is something God's doing because you know what? On the 13th of this month, we've got a chapel. We've got somebody coming. I, I called my son. I was just, you know, the Bible says a lot about orphans and widows. So specifically calls out those two groups of peoples, orphans and widows. And so it's people that are lonely, people that are by themselves that have nobody to help them. And uh, so I try to make sure that we do nursing home ministry and I try to make sure that we I thought about orphans. I thought, well, we've got, you know, a few orphanages around the world, but what about my own city? What can we do for the orphans in our city? So, you know, if you really want to help people, sometimes you've got to get aggressive. You can't wait for, you know, God to come beat you over the head and make you help somebody. You've got to ask a few questions and dig around a little bit. So I, I called my son who's over our missions and I said, I want you to contact the orphanages in this city and see what we can do to help them. What, is there something we can do to help them? And so somebody that works for us met with all, all the orphanages and we found out all about fostering and this and that and something else and different supplies they needed. And so we've got a man coming in that represents all the orphanages to talk to our staff. And I hope that some of our employees will want to foster. Do you know that I read and this sounds almost impossible, but I read that if one family out of every evangelical church in America would adopt a child, we could completely clear out the foster care system. One family, there's that many churches that if just one family, would do, now everybody can't do that, there's no no guilt if you can't do that. But see, there was 
Was it 27 families, Donna? 27 families, that's awesome. Thank you for doing that. That's amazing. And you know what? It may not be easy. You, you take a kid out of one of these orphanages, they, they may have some issues, but do you wanna help people or not? You know, helping people is not always easy. Dave can tell you. <laughs> Listen, Dave was 26. He was praying for a wife. He wanted to get married. He was dating three girls. That man believes that works without, faith without works is dead. <laughs> he was dating three women at one time and then he met me. <laughs> I was outside washing my mother's car in short shorts and we had beehives back then. I had hair up to here. He thought I was cute and he said, hey, when you get done washing that car, you wanna wash mine? I said, if you want your car washed, buddy, wash it yourself. And he said the thing that went off in him is that's the girl for me. Now, he either had to be crazy or, you know, it was the Holy Ghost, one of the two. I don't highly recommend this, but we had five dates and got married. He, he had to marry me before he found out what he was getting. But he, <laughs> Here's the mistake he made. He prayed that God would give him somebody to help. <laughs> Woo, I qualified, let me tell you. <laughs> and so you gotta keep in mind, I just, just think what would have happened if he wouldn't have stuck with me in those first, especially three or four years that were so hard. Just look at how many people we have been able to help all over the world because he did not give up on me. Come on, don't give up on people. God's got a plan for their life just like he's got a plan for yours. Everything does not have to be comfortable and convenient for us. We don't have the slightest idea what it means to suffer. I mean, yes, we have our pains and our joint pains and our back aches and we have loss and you know, we have difficulties in our life. But how many people today will really put themselves out and inconvenience themselves in order to do something for God that's not very pleasant? Not too many, amen? And we need to get back to more of that. So now I guess I better try to preach my message since I have 10 minutes left. <laughs> so you not only don't have to feel guilty, when you sin, all you need to do is admit it. Don't make excuses for it. Don't try to justify it, just admit it. Repent, which means be willing to turn away from it. Don't wanna do that anymore, Lord. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Help me. Confess it, receive his forgiveness. And that, I think that's a part of it. I think sometimes we pray, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, but we never actually take the time to receive it. So I receive your forgiveness, I take it. And that sin is gone now and there's no condemnation. Right. And just take a moment. We, we just do it all too fast. Take a moment and just soak that in. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And then boy, you just, when the devil comes around saying, you say, shut up. I'm forgiven and I don't take your false guilt. I won't take it because it's a lie from the pit of hell. God's word says I am forgiven. Amen. Come on, give God a praise. This can make a huge difference in your life if you can get this today. Not in your head in your heart. I can't do anything about how you feel, but I can tell you the truth of God's word. 
You may think I'm guilty. God, will, the, the devil will put thoughts in your head. You're guilty, you're guilty. You don't deserve. You don't deserve. People go to God and say, oh God, if you'll just do this and if you'll just do that. You know, just means barely enough. Don't pray like that. Ask God for big things, bold things. Ask him to use you in a mighty way. Now, I can't do anything about your feelings, but I can tell you not to live by them. Live on the other side of your feelings. Yeah, I feel guilty, but I'm not guilty. <laughs> I feel like I don't deserve this, but in Christ I do. See, this is not about your do, it's about your who. It's who you are. The devil will try to tell you everything you do wrong, but God's word tells you who you are in Christ and who you belong to. <clears throat> well, one happy person over there. <laughs> All right. Hebrews 10:10. 10, 10. Once and for all. And in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy. Everybody say have been. It doesn't say will be if you do a lot of good works. It says you have been made holy. Well, wait a minute. If I'm holy, then why do I still do all this dumb stuff? Because your who is different than your do. <laughs> See, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay and I'm on my way. And this time next year when I come, I'll be a little better than I am this year, but I'll still have a ways to go. And that's okay because all God really cares about is that you want to do what's right and that you're making a little bit of progress. Amen? Just a little bit of progress. Amen. You, no, Paul said, I've not arrived. <laughs> I want to be perfect, but I've not arrived. But he said, one thing I do, it is my one aspiration. It means more to me than anything else, letting go of what lies behind and pressing toward those things that are ahead. Every day is a brand new day. Every night when the sun sets, it sets on all the mistakes of that day. And every morning when the sun comes up, it's a brand new day. You get a brand new start all over again. We got a clean slate. Okay, you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Just like there was the holy of holies, the holy place and the outer court, we are now the temple of God. The Old Testament temple had that holy of holies which only the high priests could go into and then only once a year. Well, we have a high priest also and he lives in our most holy place, our spirit. And he had to come and make that holy so he could live there because he can't be anywhere that's not holy. So you have so many good things in your spirit because the Holy Spirit is in there. So all the fruit of the spirit is in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, humility. So we really shouldn't go around saying, I'm just not patient. I'm not this and I'm not that. And I'm you are holy, you are righteous, you are sanctified, you are justified, you are free from sin. But then in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, it says, now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work far, it says work it out. That means work with the Holy Spirit who's in you to take all these wonderful things that the Bible says are in you and get them worked out into your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Get that mind renewed, stop living by those feelings, and use your free will to turn your will over to God. And then that's that whole process, that's really when you're born again, you come out of Egypt in slavery. 
this whole soul thing, getting it renewed and dying to self, that's the wilderness time that you spend. And then all of a sudden you come into the promised land. And that's when you start actually living it in your daily life. It gets easy to forgive people. You know what? I can forgive somebody now before they even get finished offending me. <laughs> While you're in the middle of making me mad, I can forgive you. <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because I've been there, done that, and I know that God wants me to forgive people for me. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You may not even be sorry for what you did, but I don't have to be in prison because of what you did. You hurt me once, I don't have to keep letting you hurt me every day of my life. I can, do you know how mad it makes the devil when you are happy? The joy of the Lord is my strength. We sing it, but do we know it? The joy of the Lord is my strength. I, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. We are God's personal representatives in the world. The Amplified Bible says he is making his appeal to the world through us. You are the only Jesus that people are ever gonna see. And you can't be a sourpuss Christian who looks like you've been baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> I mean, people already think that Christians can't have any fun. We need to have more fun than anybody on the earth. Well, you know, if you're a Christian, you can't have any fun. No, you don't get to have hangovers anymore and you know, all that fun stuff. But you can have a joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory and the peace that passes understanding. You can have peace when everything in your life is upside down and you don't have a clue how you're gonna get any of it answered. Amen. Amen. Woo. Yes. <laughs> Glory to God, we need to bring that second service back and let them get this part. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 12. Whereas this one Christ, after he had offered a single sacrifice for our sins that shall avail for all time, <laughs> sat down at the right hand of God. Folks, let me tell you, it is finished. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, see under the old covenant, they had to go back. Every year, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. And they never completely got rid of the feeling of sin and guilt. Their sin was covered, but it says they were always conscious of it. But our sin is not covered. It's washed. You can't find it anymore. It got in the flow of that blood and got washed away. And we don't have to live with a sin consciousness. We can live with a righteousness consciousness. And the more you believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, the more right things you will do. See, God never asks us to do anything without giving us the equipment to do it. Oh, Jesus. I wish I could sing, I'd just end with a song. <laughs> oh, Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, he has forever completely. <laughs> you get it? Forever completely. 
cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. Hebrews 10, 17 and 18, he then goes on to say, and their sins and their law breakings, I will remember no more. Now where there is absolute remission, forgiveness and cancellation of the penalty of those sins and law breakings, there is no longer any offering that you can make to atone for your sin. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. I think it's dropping from your head to your spirit. I think you're getting it. Now, let me just tell you that before the day's over, you're gonna probably do something that you shouldn't do. I mean, maybe not, but you know, David prayed that God would forgive him for his unconscious faults. And I pray that too, because you know, we sin in thought, word or deed, so good gracious. I mean, just one stinky thought about somebody. But God's got it all covered. But let's just say that you will do something before the day's over. Could even be before you get out of the parking lot. Because you know there's a lot of traffic in these parking lots. And boy, if you're not a patient person, which you really are a patient person, but maybe you haven't found that out yet because that patience is in your spirit and maybe you haven't worked with the Holy Spirit to get it out here yet. And in the morning, you're gonna wake up and the devil's gonna say, well, that did you a lot of good to go hear that preaching. <laughs> you are mammy, 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 mammy. And that's when you gotta remember what you learned today. And that's when you gotta stand up for yourself and do some real spiritual warfare and fight the good fight of faith and say, I am not saved by my works. I am saved by what Jesus did for me and he did it once and for all and he did it completely and forever and he remembers my sin no more. So just crawl back in the hole you came out of because I belong to God, not you. Come on, give him praise. I wouldn't jump, but I'm too old. I wish I could still jump, but it hurts my back. So I have to do this. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody shout, I'm free. All right, let me pray for you. Father, I do pray that people will retain what they've learned today. Please let it be a revelation, not just more information. And help them to enjoy what Jesus died to give them. Help us put a smile on his face by just enjoying the sacrifice that he made. We love you, Lord, and we wanna be good. We wanna do everything right. But sometimes we mess up and we need your help. And I'm so grateful to know that we always have it. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.